I was far too drunk to be driving as fast as I was going. Truth be told, I was probably too drunk to even sit in a parked car without all the windows open. But I had places to be, so I kept the pedal down. Route 50 was light on traffic, maybe because it was December, perhaps it was 3 a.m. Either way, the few cars I did encounter were easy enough to pass, and I started to feel like a toddler struggling to stay inside the lines with every swerve. It was hot for December, so I did have my window down. My headlights were blinking in and out. I get them fixed eventually, maybe tomorrow, maybe next month. In that flickering light, I saw a deer sprint out from the trees at the shoulder of the road, then across the highway. Another swerve and another near miss. My heart was in my throat, but I felt good. My buzz was still roaring. There was a bright patch ahead on the highway. My vision was a little blurry, but it was clearly a town. My stomach cramped and rumbled. I was starving. I saw a speed limit sign on the shoulder for 50 miles per hour. Grinning, I sped up until the needle was pushing 75. Buildings began whipping by me on either side of the Camaro. Blue and fast, I loved my car more than any woman i would ever met. There weren't many people out at 3 a.m., but I tried to at least keep a lookout for cops hidden in alleys. When I saw the Taco Bell approaching on my left, I slammed on the brakes and spun the wheel hard towards the building. There was one bad moment where my fuzzy brain mixed up the pedal and the brake. I sorted it out and screeched to a halt a few spaces in the parking lot. I climbed out of the car and stretched. The drive through would have been faster, but I desperately needed to take a leak and drain the bladder full of bourbon and Red Bull. The Taco Bell was lit up with a soft white lighting. It looked empty, but open. I pushed the glass door and grinned when a little bell rang above me. My smile dropped as I noticed the two workers behind the counter. The guy was tall, looked to be in his early 30s, and had a busted up face like he just walked in from a fight club behind the restaurant. Nasty purple and yellow bruises covered his cheeks, sat under his eyes, and peeked out from his collar. He must have been covered in them under his uniform. The girl next to him was both more or less off-putting. She appeared to be the same age, much shorter, pretty in a hollow way with her blonde hair and black glasses. There was no visible damage on her, but a dark stain soaked the bottom half of her shirt. It was a reddish brown, maybe some kind of sauce, hopefully some kind of sauce. You okay? I asked her, walking towards the counter. The girl didn't reply, didn't even look at me. The young dude next to her picked at a shallow cut next to his ear. What can I get you? He asked. I blinked and tried to shake some of the fermentation of my brain. Tacos. Yes, sir. This would be the place for that. What kind? How many? Uh, five chicken, five beef. Uh, one of those crunch wrap things. Uh, nachos, some cinnamon twists, oh, and a Diet Coke. Oh, and as much Diablo sauce as you can give me. Is that all? I put a hand down on the counter to steady myself. Yeah, and I need to take a leak. Bathroom's back there, the guy said, pointing to a pair of doors in the corner. I turned away from the counter, took a step towards the restroom, and then stopped. Now that I had a full view of the dining area, I saw that people were sitting at one of the tables. They weren't there when I walked in. I was positive of that. Maybe they entered while I was ordering, but I didn't hear the bell above the door ring. It was like they just appeared. I counted three men and a woman, all different ages, all equally awful looking. It was like they were sick, pale and bloodless, with ringed, sleepless eyes. One of the guys had a red-brown stain just like the girl at the counter, only his covered the back of his shirt. They all watched me silently as I walked past them towards the bathroom. I only tripped once. I was pretty proud of that. While the rest of the Taco Bell was relatively clean and well lit, the bathroom looked like I might catch a disease just by taking a deep breath. 
The floor was dirty. The walls were stained. The lights flickered and smelled vile. One of the two stalls didn't have a door. The other did, but was occupied. A pair of ragged cowboy boots visible under the wall. Whatever. There was an open urinal, and that was all I needed. It was disgusting and clogged, but I did what I needed to do and went to wash my hands. Was While I was cleaning up, I took a look at my reflection in the mirror. It was wrong. I mean, it was me, but my face was as pale as the weirdos in the dining room. There was an angry red cut above my eye on my forehead. I reached up to touch it and felt something prick my finger. I jerked my hand away, then went back to probe around gently. There was a small triangle of glass sticking in the cut. I pulled it out and dropped it into the sink, hands shaking as I turned on the water. There was a loud bang from behind me. I whirled around in time to see the door of the occupied stall shake. It was like the guy inside was slamming into it. You okay, buddy? I called out, feeling a lot sober than I had in hours. Are you? The door shook again, louder than before. There was a strange, quiet wailing sound coming out of the stall. It grew to some halfway growl, halfway scream. I turned away, closing my eyes. I must have hit my head at some point. I was imagining things, or... I opened my eyes to find the mirror in front of me completely fogged. As I watched, something invisible dragged against the mirror, drawing a shape or letters in the fog. I didn't stick around to find out what the message was. I left the bathroom running. Once I busted out the door, though, I was stopped so quickly I tripped. The dining room was packed and the people at the tables and in the booths looked like they'd been dragged out of the local morgue. Men and women, a few teenagers and old folks, they were all in various stages of decomposition. I saw missing limbs, exposed ribs, one so raw I could see a gray sack of unmoving lung through it, cuts and holes, and everywhere, that red-brown stain. The interior of the restaurant didn't look so clean anymore either. Now it resembled the bathroom, with mold in the corners and a thick white-green fluid in puddles on the floor. Everything reeked. I couldn't tell if it was the decaying people or the dirty room, but the smell was like a physical force scorching my throat and eyes and twisting my stomach. Your order, bud, a voice said behind me. I turned and saw the guy from the counter, carrying a tray of full rotting food. The tacos were covered in a fuzzy mold, and the rest of the pile was alive with a squirming knot of glossy white maggots. I slapped the tray and stumbled back, then ran for the door. The little bell from earlier was now a rusted lump. I pressed against the bar repeatedly, but the door wouldn't open. The dead things behind me were laughing. Soft at first, then hysterical, as I slammed my shoulder into the glass so hard I bounced off. Their laughter became a buzz like flies over summer roadkill. The doors locked, I heard the man from the counter say. You can't leave. The hell I can't, I growled, standing up. I felt something grab me and press my face against the glass door. I did. Then I began to sob. In the orange sodium glow of the parking lot lamps, I saw my Camaro. It was destroyed, wrapped halfway around a street light. It was no longer a car, only a lump of metal and broken glass. What I saw lying in the parking lot was worse though. A man, just my size, dressed like me, crumpled like a doll dropped from high, soaking in a pool of blood. He, I, had been thrown through the front windshield during the crash. That moment when I accidentally hit the pedal instead of the brake. What if I'd actually kept on the pedal, 
heck of a way to die, I heard the counterman whisper. You shouldn't drive drunk, buddy. Too easy for people to get hurt. Thank God this looks like a one-car crash. A single fatality. Now, go grab a uniform from the back. You're going to be working here for a very, very long time. No, I said, pulling back. This isn't real. This isn't fair. I have to leave. The man's grin turned into a snarl. He slapped me, hard and quick, then hit me again, this time with an open fist. I stumbled back into the front door. The short girl that was behind the counter when I came in hit me next. She grabbed at my collar and scratched my neck. Someone else slammed into me from the side, and then I was on the ground. Figures crowded around me, dead legs kicking my ribs, stomping me, grinding me into the tile. Blows fell on me like hail on a window. I begged and screamed and whimpered, but they kept hitting me. Eventually, the dead pulled back. I stood up, bruised and ruined, and decided to take my chance. I ran at the locked door, arms in front of my face to protect my eyes. I jumped and felt the glass break, and I woke up on the pavement, feeling like every bone in my body was broken. I groaned, spitting out a tooth. Someone was standing over me. I flinched when they leaned down. Easy, buddy, a voice said. I called 911. They'll be here soon. I blacked out and woke up much later in a hospital bed. The doctors told me that I was lucky to be alive after the crash and being ejected through the front windshield of my Camaro. My injuries from the accident were severe, but not fatal. A broken arm, four busted ribs, a concussion, two lost teeth, and another cracked, as well as every inch of me covered in road burns and deep bruises. Since it was a DUI, I wouldn't be driving anytime soon and could face fines, maybe even jail time. I accept that. Whatever the consequences, I know that I am truly lucky. I escaped hell. I don't know if I'll ever be happy again. I'm a 25-year-old single dad. My high school girlfriend Samantha and I had our baby in the very first year of our marriage. Our son Liam has autism, but I never treated him different. But unfortunately, his mother did. Samantha couldn't love him, and I still don't understand why. Because Liam always loved her. Whenever she came close to him, he stretched his loving arms just to be in her lap, but Samantha turned her face away in disgust. Our marriage didn't last. After a certain point, she wanted nothing to do with our son or me. She left me for some rich guy, but I was happy and proud to be Liam's father. He's a bundle of joy, and he means the world to me. Many of my relatives told me to remarry, as a dad isn't enough to raise a baby but I wanted to prove them wrong. Parenthood doesn't depend on gender. It depends on love and care. Liam and I built our small world with joy. He would often look out the window and point to the neighborhood kids saying, Dad, they say I'm different. Different, am I? He repeated words due to his autism, but I always made him feel strong. I said, yes, they are right. You are different. You are more kind, joyful, and mostly strong than any of them. That's why you're different. Don't let anyone tell you less than that. And the smile on his face rose again hearing this. Liam's brain had a slow development, so though he is nine, he behaves like a five-year-old. I could see people noticing him whenever we were out but I always kept my head high so that he realized that his dad was proud of him. Parents need to stand up for their kids, and I did exactly that for my son. Liam and I always went out for dinner every Friday night, 
He loved eating burgers. So Friday night was fast food night. Similarly, one Friday night, I drove him to the mall. After playing in the gaming section for almost two hours, we got hungry and decided to have some dinner. Liam wanted to have a burger, so I took him to Wendy's, 20 minutes from the mall right beside the highway. The restaurant was not as crowded as I expected. Liam and I sat down at a corner table. I took a quick look at the menu and then walked to the counter to place our order. A young Wendy's employee was standing behind the counter. He gave me a courteous smile and said, Welcome to Wendy's. May I take your order, sir? Yeah, we'll have two grilled chicken cheeseburgers, uh, one medium fry and two sprites. Okay, please have a seat and I'll bring your order to you. Thank you. After paying, I returned to my seat and noticed Liam staring at the exit with a smiling face. Generally, he smiles at every passerby, so I thought he must have seen someone outside. However, I didn't see anyone outside. I talked to him about how much fun we had when Liam looked over my shoulder, ignoring me. The shop bell rang and I heard footsteps behind us. Turning around, I saw a woman in her late forties entering the restaurant. Everything would have been entirely normal if she didn't dress like the red-headed girl in the Wendy's logo. She wore two ponytails and had excessive makeup to look like a kid, which backfired. Instead of looking innocent, she looked creepy. Her eyes were light green, making it even more bizarre when she smiled at us. The Wendy's girl. Look, Dad. Wendy's girl. Yeah, she looked somewhat close to that. She's real. Real she is. Right? I got weird vibes from this woman the moment she entered this place. The guy behind the counter also seemed uncomfortable having this out of place customer. The two to three people eating there started to whisper among themselves about her unusual appearance. Needless to say, none of them were used to seeing what they were seeing. Meanwhile, the food came and Liam's attention shifted from her. I also concentrated on my food. I just wanted to finish early so we could go home. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Liam? The spoon on her nose. Her nose looks funny. <laughs> I looked at the woman and she was doing some kiddish stunt to make my son laugh sitting at the corner table. She stuck a plastic spoon on her nose and made funny faces, which looked quite disturbing. But she wasn't doing anything wrong, so I couldn't confront her about her behavior at the moment. We were almost done eating when the woman walked up to our table. What's your name? Is it Mr. Smiley Face? <laughs> Liam. I'm Liam. The woman completely ignored me and started to talk to my son like I wasn't even there. Do you like my hairstyle, Liam? You're funny. <laughs> funny. So, where do you live? Excuse me, do you mind? Liam, where do you live? I was stunned by her audacity. Even as I asked her to back off, she wasn't budging. The woman raised her dirt-filled bony fingers and went to caress Liam's cheek. I slapped her hand and said, Well, back off from my son. You're a rude father. I was just trying to play with him. Well, just leave us alone, or I'll have to take some serious steps. Is there a problem here, sir? The Wendy's employee came too, and I told him how weird this woman was. The employee apologized on her behalf. He told the woman to either sit and eat quietly or leave the restaurant at once. Hearing this, the woman's eyes widened in fury, and she said to the employee in her shrill voice, What? You can't throw me out of here. I'm the Wendy's girl. Can't you recognize me? Ma'am, please go take your seat. You're making everyone uncomfortable here. Shut up, you peasant. Go to hell with your restaurant. The woman insulted the employee and did something even more hateful after that. She walked up to her table, spat on her food, and bumped the table on the floor. Creating a big scene, she left the restaurant. What a psycho. You should call the police and report her. I will. We have CCTV for a reason. The employee went to call the cops and I left the restaurant with Liam. 
We sat inside our car and drove home. The neighborhood we live in is still under construction, so very few houses had residences. After sundown, it felt like an abandoned village. I was unlocking the door while Liam stood beside me. <laughs> what is it now, Liam? I asked without looking at him. She's making faces again. What are you saying? The Wendy's girl. My stomach dropped as soon as Liam said this. I felt my hands getting numb. She has a knife, like the one in our kitchen. I immediately turned back and saw that freaky woman dressed like the Wendy's girl was now running at me at full speed, holding a big sharp knife in her hand. There was hatred in her eyes and anger on her face, but her creepy smile still retained. She looked like the Wendy's girl from hell. I started to panic as I had no weapon to protect my kid or myself from this psycho woman. I prayed to God for the door to unlock somehow. It was the easiest task of my day, but that moment, it felt like the most challenging job I was compelled to do. <laughs> Her crazy chuckle was coming closer, and when she was a few inches away from striking me, I managed to open the door and drag Liam in with me. But even though I got in, Liam got stuck in between as the psycho woman grabbed his other hand. I like this kid. Let him go, you witch. I tried to free my son's hand from her grasp, and she stabbed me in the arm. Writhing in pain, I let go of Liam's hand out of reflex, and the woman picked him up and started to run. The knife was stuck in my flesh. I was bleeding horribly, but I still got up and took the knife out. Piercing my veins, the knife came out, spilling blood like a horror movie. Dad, Dad. I heard Liam's cry and watched the lady running down the road abducting my son. I ran like a cheetah. I forgot about my wound. All I wanted was to save Liam. She might be one sick psycho, but she wasn't faster than me. I caught up with her, grabbed her red hair, and pulled her so hard that a patch of her bloody scalp came out. She screamed in terrible pain and dropped Liam on the hard concrete. Liam's head hit the ground, and while I was busy picking him up, the lady ran away. It's been a week since my son has been in a coma. The Wendy's guy has filed a complaint about this woman, and I too have been to the cops. They're searching everywhere for her, but still no lead. I'm pretty sure it'll be hard to recognize her without the Wendy's girl costume. Day and night, I'm praying for my son to wake up and that psycho woman to get arrested for what she did. My best friend Jim and I had a great knack for traveling in our college days. We often went hiking or camping whenever we got the time. This incident happened when we went to Nebraska for a short trip. We needed a place for one night before heading to my aunt's house. We didn't want to spend much, so Jim initiated the idea of booking a cheap Motel 6. We got some pretty good deals and found a budget motel. We booked two separate rooms with single beds. The day before the arrival, I called the motel owner to confirm our reservation. In return, I got an unpleasant surprise. The owner told me that he accidentally double booked a single room, and now that there were no more rooms available. I got very angry. But Jim and I decided to manage as it was a matter of one night. After driving for hours, when we finally reached the motel, I realized what a huge mistake we had made. The motel looked nothing like the pictures on the site. It was out of maintenance for a long time. The walls were rusty and old, filled with spots. The rooms were barely hanging, it seemed. We walked to the counter and a skinny woman in her mid-fifties stood there. Welcome, sir, welcome. I called you yesterday, and you said you have double booked the same room. Oh yes, I remember. We are extremely sorry. But we also have another room, which is a double bed, if you want. I can shift you there. We won't be charging you extra. Jim and I exchanged looks, and we thought it'd be better to sleep in a big bed than sleeping on the floor. 
The woman took a rusty big key and told us to follow her. She was walking so slowly that Jim and I almost bumped into her while trying to walk past. My eyes were on the rooms, and I realized this motel is a den for drug addicts and antisocials. I could smell a strong odor of illegal substances in the air of the motel. Here, this is your room, sir. We stopped in front of a white door, and it had no number. Jim said in a confused voice, Why doesn't it have a room number? Well, we just finished the maintenance work here, so the numbers haven't been assigned yet. As we entered the room, we were surprised. The room was way different from the others. It was extremely clean, and I could smell the bleach. A white, comfy bed stood in the middle of the room. There was a big mirror in the corner. A set of two chairs paired with a wooden table resided next to the window. There was a big lamp near the bed. The woman handed me the keys and left. Jim closed the door and said, Thank God we got this room, otherwise you would have to sleep on the floor. <laughs> Shut up. I went to the window and peeked behind the curtains. Jim looked at me with curious eyes and said, What? What is it? I have a bad feeling about this place, man. Yeah, didn't you smell the pot in the air? This place is crowded with druggies. No, that's not what's bothering me. Then what is it? I'm talking about this room. They didn't tell us about this room before, and now all of a sudden, they assign this under the same rate? Also, look how extremely clean it is, considering the other rooms. Jim opened a beer can and threw himself on the bed, saying, You're probably the first man on earth who was complaining about this motel room being too clean. I felt the mocking undertone and got quiet to avoid any more leg pulling. But like a sore tooth, this uncanny feeling of being in this room kept hammering me. I unpacked my bags and went to take a shower. The bathroom had a hundred times more chemical smell than the room. I turned on the tap to fill the bathtub, but instead of water, a weird gurgling sound came out. I closed the tap and turned it on again, but this time, splashing a massive chunk of black hair, dirty clogged water came out of the tap. What the hell? What now? I pointed to the bathtub. The clogged water had a foul smell, which choked my nostrils right away. Both of us decided not to use the bathroom anymore. I could barely eat that night after seeing those long strands of black hair coming out of the tap. I changed my clothes and went to bed. Jim was a heavy sleeper and he snored a lot. But I was tired too, so in spite of the car racing sounds coming out of his nose, I fell asleep. I don't exactly remember the time, but I woke up hearing the tap water running in the bathroom. I recalled turning it off before going to bed. Jim. Jim. Did you keep the tap running again? Jim didn't say anything, only snored in reply. I realized I had to turn it off. I got out of the covers and walked to the bathroom, rubbing my sleepy eyes. As I stepped inside the dark bathroom, I saw the curtain surrounding the bathtub was also closed. A weird breathing sound was coming from the other side. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw a shadowy figure sitting in the bathtub. Being completely shocked, I moved the curtain in one go, and there was no one. The bathtub was filled with black, murky water that smelled like death. I closed the tap and was about to turn back when bubbles formed on the water. Slowly, the murky water started to form bubbles in a very unnatural way. This went on for a few seconds, then everything got pin drop silent. Like the air stopped blowing, the clock stopped ticking, even the bubbles stopped making the sound. An unknown fear grabbed my feet and glued them to the cold bathroom floor. Suddenly, that heavy breathing took place again, and the still black water started to move. I stood like a statue and watched all this happen with my own eyes. The next few minutes were probably the scariest times of my life. Suddenly, 
A human head started to surface from the bathtub. It was a woman's head, no doubt, as I could see her long black hair dangling. A chunk of hair was missing from her head, resulting in a bald spot. Her face was completely covered, and she was making a spine-chilling sound from her closed mouth. It was a mix of a subdued growl and a painful moan. The blood in my veins froze in fear, and sweat appeared on my forehead. The woman rose from the murky water, but didn't step outside the bathtub. She then pointed to the ceiling, and I saw her rotting hands for the first time. Her skin was so filthy that some of her fingernails were peeling off. Is this... is this real? I said with incredible difficulty. The woman, again, didn't say anything, just pointed to the ceiling. She then parted her hair with her rotted hands, and I saw her face. I don't think anyone can even imagine such a face. Her skin looks slimy like a frog. The scariest part of her face was her eyes. Her eyes were sewn closed with a black thread. She then slowly smiled at me, and I screamed at the top of my lungs. Trawling like a coward dog, I came out of the bathroom. Jim woke up hearing my scream and got even more shocked seeing me crouching on the floor drenched in sweat. What happened? Why did you scream? I don't want to stay here anymore. We have to leave now. But why? Is everything all right? No! Take your stuff and meet me at the car. I grabbed my bag and rushed to my car, barefooted. Jim followed me. We didn't bother to inform the woman who let us in. Jim kept asking me so many questions, but I just drove down the highway. All I wanted was to get away from this messed up motel. At six in the morning, when I reached my aunt's house, she got shocked seeing us at the doorstep. After some hours, when I finally calmed myself down, I told them everything I saw there. Jim said it was all a bad dream, but I knew how real it all felt. We complained to the Motel 6 website. Everyone expected the matter to end there, but three months after our incident, a horrifying incident came out of the news. Like us, many other boarders complained about this sketchy motel, and some even went to the cops saying that they saw a dead girl in one of their rooms. The cops searched the property, and the truth unfolded. They found a dead body of a girl floating in the motel water reservoir located on its roof. This woman, named Riley, came with her boyfriend Max to this motel to fool around, but her boyfriend murdered her in that same room where we stayed. Getting freaked out after realizing what he had done, Max bribed the hotel owner to help him disappear her body. For a certain amount of cash, the owner and Riley's boyfriend dumped her body inside the water tank and then cleared the room to remove all evidence. That's why the strong smell of bleach kept roaming in the air of the room. When my aunt and Jim saw the news, they couldn't speak for a while. I still get nightmares of that girl pointing at the ceiling while standing in the bathtub, smelling like death. The fat man was my least favorite customer. You could smell him come in before you saw him. Nearly seven feet tall and at least 400 pounds, the guy had a distinct smell, something like cinnamon and burning hair. I didn't dislike the man because of his appearance or odor though, no. I hated whenever the customer, Brad, came in because he ate his pizza like he was going to war. Brad would settle his bulk into a corner table, then order our largest deep dish pizza to start. That was his appetizer. He liked to work his way through our hot and ready menu. If a particular item caught his attention that day, he ordered double. His mid-meal break was a triple order of crazy bread, an order of wings, and all of this was washed down with liters of Diet Pepsi. The way Brad ate terrified children and ran off other customers. He hit the pizza harder than the Allies when they stormed Normandy Beach. 
Globs of sauce and chunks of crust went flying in every direction when Brad chewed. It was like someone set off a hand grenade inside of a lasagna. His shirt, cheeks, and table were splattered each session before he was halfway done. Anyone sitting within a dozen feet of Brad was in danger of being struck by debris and the sounds he made when he ate. And I still have nightmares about the slurping, chomping, gurgling, moaning sounds. Suffice to say, no one ever wanted to wait on Brad when he visited our Little Caesars. So, as the manager, that duty usually fell on to me. We tolerated Brad scaring away our other customers because there really wasn't a legal reason to ban him. That is, until one morning in January, when Brad waddled into the restaurant holding a small cooler, took his usual seat in the corner, and ordered every cheese pizza that we had in the kitchen. Brad, I think we've got about 80 pizzas cooling back there, I told him. How many do you actually want? 80 is a good start, but you'll need to keep them coming. I have an appetite today. What's in the cooler? Brad grinned. His teeth were awful. Just some toppings I brought from home. We don't really allow that. Do I need to register a complaint with Little Caesar's main offices again? I sighed. <sighs> Fine. Whatever. Just don't make a mess. Brad lifted his cooler onto the table and started poking around inside while I walked back to the kitchen to give them his order. When I returned with Brad's Diet Pepsi and first pizza, I nearly gagged when the smell from his cooler hit me. Inside of the box were dozens of plastic baggies arranged around a few ice packs. The baggies were smeared with a thick pinkish fluid and contained gray chunks of what I had to assume was meat. Whatever it was reeked like it was spoiled. You can't eat that, I said setting Brad's order on his table. The food in your cooler has gone bad. Brad just smiled and popped one of the gray blobs into his mouth, then licked the pink fluid from his chin. I retreated before my stomach betrayed me. The rest of the staff and I barricaded ourselves in the kitchen as well as we could. Every few minutes, I would run another pizza out like I was charging across a battlefield dodging cannon fire. Brad's rotten toppings and wood chipper eating style scared away most of the customers immediately. One brave family tried to stick it out, sitting at the opposite end of the room, but Brad ended up choking on a slice of pizza, then coughing it up. The wad of dough and phlegm shot all over the tables and splattered the family. Brad started laughing, spraying more food. That was too much. I stormed over to Brad's table as the family left in disgust. That's it. You're banned from Little Caesars, I shouted. Brad just continued to munch. But I haven't finished. Finish up then. Eat as much as you want and more. But after you leave today, you're banned permanently. Brad shrugged and thrust his empty glass at me. Refill. The big man continued to eat for hours. I'd never seen him tear through pizza, wings, and crazy bread like he did that day. At one point, he slouched over, and I thought he was finally done. But then, he popped up and beckoned me over with one swollen hand. I didn't know how Brad could possibly keep eating. The buttons had popped from his shirt, and his belly spilled over his legs. I want to try some of my toppings warm, he said, nodding towards one of the disgusting baggies. Toss those in the microwave for me. Absolutely not. If you do, I promise I'll leave here in the next hour. I pulled my shirt over my nose and tried to defend against the stench and gingerly picked up the baggie with a napkin. I hurried back to the kitchen, poured out the vile gunk into a bowl and put it in the microwave. The odor was overwhelming, and I knew we'd need to air out the kitchen for days to get rid of it. I immediately regretted listening to Brad's request. Maybe it was time to call the cops and have him tossed out. More! I heard him yell from the dining room. Stack them high. 
And I need a refill. Since I was watching the microwave, my assistant manager Bianca was the one who had to run out the next tower of pizzas and a two liter. The microwave beeped and I extracted the foul contents. When the steam cleared, I nearly dropped the bowl. Not because it was hot, but because outside of the little baggies, I could finally get a clear look at the toppings Brad had brought from home. Most were unrecognizable lumps of pink brown, but one object was unmistakably, undeniably the bottom half of a human ear. I placed the bowl on the counter, my face cold with shock. Before I could decide how to react, there was a shriek from the dining room. I made it to the kitchen door just as Bianca came running inside, clutching her arm. At first, I thought she'd gotten pizza sauce all over her hand. There was so much red. Then I realized all of her fingers on her left hand except for her index and thumb were gone. Nothing but raw stumps. He bit me! Bianca screamed. I tried to put the pizzas down for him and that monster snapped. I heard the sound of falling tables and a loud crash. Not one part of me wanted to go look, but I was the manager. The staff at Little Caesars were counting on me. Wrap Bianca's hand in a towel and keep pressure on it, I instructed one of the cooks. You, call 911, I said to another. We need an ambulance and the police. I took a breath and walked out into the dining room to find Brad on the floor. He'd fallen from his chair and knocked the contents of his table everywhere. He had half of a pizza in his mouth, his jaws trembling as he chewed, and he was crawling towards another pile of slices. What did you do? I whispered. What is wrong with you? Brad spit out the pizza long enough to laugh. <laughs> she wouldn't have gotten so close to my food. You don't mess with a man's food. My food! Where are my toppings? What are they? Friends and family. I've been saving them up for a while. For something special. Brad army crawled on his elbows, dragging his descended gut along the tiles. He made it to a nearby pile of pizza and began devouring it. His whole body looked swollen as a blood-drunk tick. The police are on their way, Brad. He nodded and started eating faster. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The man shoveled food into his jaw, swallowing without chewing. I couldn't help but stare. Once all the pizza was gone, Brad laid on his belly, licking his fingers. More, he demanded. No. More. For someone that big, Brad crawled fast. He came at me, pulling his bulk along with his bloody fingernails. I ran, tipping over a table and crashing to the floor. There was a tug at my foot. Brad had a hand wrapped around my ankle. He dragged me towards him and I reacted on reflex, kicking out. My shoe connected a crack and Brad jerked away. His nose bent at an unnatural angle. I said more, he growled, leaning on a table to stand up. But the table couldn't take his weight. The stand cracked when he was halfway standing and Brad slammed into the floor, gut first. There was a horrible ripping sound and I saw Brad's eyes go blank. He tried to rise again, but something was wrong. When he got to his hands and knees, it became clear that his body had finally burst from the pressure and the force of the fall. His stomach had a tear right around the belly button. Purple intestines and undigested pizza all spilled out into a wet pile on the floor. So hungry, Brad whispered before collapsing. They had to bring in a professional disaster cleanup crew to dispose of the body and mop up the mess. We had to close the restaurant for 48 hours. To this day, Brad's last meal remains the second or third worst shift I've ever had managing at Little Caesars. I'm a 25-year-old petite woman working in an advertising agency. 
My office is in a secluded area outside the city. It was a recently built department, hence the number of employees is not more than 10 to 12 people. I shifted for this job. The work pressure was so high sometimes that most nights a group of us had to stay back for projects. Hence my regular dinner was takeout foods. I am a smoker in my non-smoking group. So, I often preferred walking to the Little Caesars pizza place while taking a smoke break. Most of the time I went alone because I liked their pizzas. So, it was one Friday night and I was still working late. We were a group of three and everyone was trying to finish quickly so that they could jump into the weekend. After an hour, I finished my work, but my colleagues were still stuck. We were all planning to leave at once so I decided to wait for them. While they worked, I went out for my usual break. The Little Caesars shop was at the end of the road. There weren't many cars that night. I crossed the street and lit my cigarette. I was walking on the footpath when a car came from my direction and flashed its bright headlights on the opposite side of the road. A man, about 40, 50 years old, was seen standing there. He was dressed in a very poor way. His khaki trousers were muddy and torn in places. He was too lean and looked pretty pathetic. There was no expression on his long, pointy face. He was just standing there, watching me. I turned my head away, feeling extremely uncomfortable, and increased my pace. I didn't look back and went straight inside the pizza store. I was about to go in when that man yelled from the back, Pizza! Pizza! <laughs> I turned back in shock and saw he was still standing at the same spot and watching me. I rushed inside and closed the door of the shop. An old woman was sitting at the counter wearing a t-shirt of the franchise. She was in her late fifties and wearing too much makeup to look young. Her wrinkled face still couldn't hide the fact that she was about my grandma's age. I was a bit surprised because I'd never seen her before. Generally a guy named Simon always attended the night shift and I'm pretty familiar with him. Is everything all right, dear? Huh? Yeah, I mean, yes. What would you like to order? Yes, of course. I embarrassingly walked up to her and started to look at the menu above the counter. I'll have one small pepperoni pizza and a Sprite. Very well. Take your seat. I'll bring it to you. I sat on the corner table right beside the big glass wall. I could see the road outside. There was a lamp post on the opposite foot. It was constantly blinking annoyingly. I was trying to look closely, searching for that creepy man. Pizza, pizza. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. The guy you were looking for is a homeless madman. He often walks these streets late nights and screams pizza whenever a customer enters the shop. He's not harmful, just a bit crazy. I, uh... I see. Here's your order. Enjoy your food. She left the tray in front of me. The pizza slices were unevenly cut. She went back to her seat and I grabbed the biggest slice to eat. I gave a big bite. I was just enjoying chewing the soft bread soaked in sauce and cheese when I felt something stringy in my mouth. Something was rolled around my tongue. I grabbed it and pulled it out from my mouth. It was a curly strand of hair. My organs whirled in disgust inside my stomach, Ooh. and I coughed out everything on the plate. The hair seemed highly similar to the old woman's hair. She looked at me like I was rude, coughing out the food. I could have screamed at her for providing a pizza with her hair as toppings on it, but I am not that confrontational by nature. I got my shit together and was deciding to leave when I heard footsteps outside. I looked at the glass and freaked out immediately. That crazy man was staring at me through the glass. 
His entire body was leaned over the glass, making his facial features look even more disturbing than before. He remained like that for some time, then started walking away. There's no way I'm going out while that man is out there. I couldn't eat the pizza after what I discovered, so I thought to call my colleagues to see if they were done by now. I planned to wait here and tell them to come meet me so that I didn't have to walk back to the office. I took out my cell phone and called them. Luckily, they were ready to leave as well. I told them to meet me at the Little Caesars pizza shop and noticed the lady at the counter watching me with a weird smile. Once I disconnected the call, she said, You're such a scaredy cat. I didn't want to answer her back because I had to wait for a few minutes more and I wanted to do that without any trouble. I couldn't eat the pizza, so I grabbed the Sprite to take a few sips. But before I could open the bottle, the seal was already broken. No sooner did I open the bottle, a foul smell of urine choked the air inside the restaurant. I got up and started vomiting on the floor. Hey, hey, you were ruining the place. Stop it. The old woman started yelling at me. She rushed towards me and pushed me back while I was feeling sick. I couldn't take it anymore. I somehow kept my balance and then started shouting at her. What the f is wrong with you? You gave me urine to drink? Are you insane? What? Don't lie. I know girls like you, trying to blame the employee for everything. Just pay the bill and get out of here. I took out a $10 bill and threw it at her while rushing towards the exit. I was walking past the counter when I saw someone lying on the floor behind the counter. I didn't fail to recognize the person on the floor in a fraction of a second. It was Simon, no doubt. His head was hurt badly and there was blood on the floor. I turned around and saw the woman standing behind me with a huge, evil smile. Seems like he likes you, dear. Saying this, she pointed at the entrance and I saw that freaky man standing outside, obstructing my way. He chuckled and said, <laughs> Pizza! Pizza! And lunged at me with a massive rock in his hand. He hit me on the cheek real hard and I felt my jaw break. Blood and teeth sprung out of my mouth altogether when the woman grabbed me from behind and started to strangle me. I kicked my hands in the air to free myself when I grabbed the woman's hair and pulled it with all my strength. A bunch of her curly hair along with a patch of bloody scalp came out. She screamed in terrible pain and set me free. I then kicked the man and he fell to the floor. I jumped and came out of the shop when I saw my two colleagues running towards me at full speed. They saw me struggling with this duo from the end of the street. We called the cops and guarded the exit until the cops came. There was no way I was letting these people go. The man remained to lie on the floor unconscious while the old woman kept cursing at me, walking back and forth like an injured wolf. When the cops came and arrested them, they gave us shocking news. This man and woman are husband and wife. They're both deranged criminals who were on the run for the last eight months from the local asylum. They pulled off some robberies and assaults throughout the city after escaping prison. I stood there and watched the cops taking them away. Before getting inside the car, they both looked back at me and said, Pizza! 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 <laughs> It's pretty shocking that I somehow managed to stay alive even after this horrifying incident. I'm a lawyer who recently just opened my firm after gaining a good reputation, but four years back, life wasn't easy for me. I came from a very needy family where my mom had to work two jobs and part-time on weekends to raise three kids. My dad was a drug addict who got sentenced to life imprisonment for murdering his boss. My elder sister, Shelly, followed my father's footsteps and left home at the age of 14 with her crackhead boyfriend. We never heard from her again. At the same time, my little sister Judy and I turned out to be normal human beings who value life too much to throw it away like our father and our oldest sister. 
After finishing high school, I finished college with a full scholarship. Thanks to God, I happened to be a good student. Judy also got a job in the preschool as a teacher, and our mom, who never had a peaceful life, finally had a peaceful death, knowing that two of her children did well with their life. Judy and I see each other on holidays, but somehow we grew apart with time. Being a lawyer, I could barely make time for myself, so once I got my first job in a prestigious law firm, all I cared about was work. This incident happened during that time. It was a Saturday night, and I won my first case, which was a big deal for me. My seniors approached me for my commendable efforts, and finally, in a long time, I felt the need to celebrate. I wanted to keep it short. I left the office and took a cab. As I drove past the nightclubs, I realized I was in no mood to be around loud music and party animals. I googled for small pubs nearby. I was scrolling through all my options when I noticed a Hooters outlet located at the highway. I asked the cab driver to take me there. I've been to the Hooters before with some clients and colleagues. We left the city and got onto the highway. After a quiet drive, the cab dropped me off at the location. Being located on the outskirts, I expected cars and bikes outside, but surprisingly, none were there. The lights were on, and the entrance door had a hung-up open sign, so I was sure it was open. Ignoring this hunch, I stepped in. If I had taken that sign seriously back then, my life would have been different. That's why people say you should trust your instincts. Stepping inside the restaurant, I got even more surprised. The place was in full swing. Men were drinking beers, laughing and flirting with the beautiful Hooters girls. No one could tell from the outside that there were so many people in here. I could tell that every man around here was heavily drunk. Their eyes had the drowsy stare, and their faces were all flushed with the hit of the toxins. A big fat guy was sitting at a table with two Hooters girls on both sides. I've been to many Hooters, but something about this one seemed weird. I sat down at the bar and ordered a beer and some chicken wings for myself. Three rows beside me, a bony drunk guy was sitting with a zoned out face and staring at the beer mug. He observed the brewing bubbles inside the glass mug and smiled on his own. I watched him doing all these drunk stunts when a sweet voice talked to me. Hi, handsome. I turned around and saw a blonde Hooters girl standing beside me, holding my beer and chicken wings on a tray. The Hooters official uniform accentuates her figure in all the right places. I've never been a flirt, but there was something in the way she looked at me that I couldn't shake her off. When she realized I was taking too long to answer her, she let out a teasing chuckle and said, <laughs> Did the cat catch your tongue, handsome? Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> Sorry, hi. So, what do people call you? I'm Jake, and uh, you are? I'm Natalie. Tonight, I'll be your Hooters girl. Just let me know if you need anything. I'm right around the corner. She placed my order on the table and gave a heart-wrenching smile before walking away. This all felt so unexpected to me. I mean, people occasionally flirt in Hooters or any pub but she was going completely out of line. I was stunned to see that she had no fear of drawing creeps to her with such attitude. I was feeling very hungry, so I concentrated on my food. The chicken wings were amazing, and the beer tasted strong. I don't drink much, but anyone could tell those normal beers don't taste like this. I was about to shove the last piece of chicken wings in my mouth when I overheard a conversation. It was that bony, drunk man sitting at some distance talking to another beautiful Hooters girl. I think I should go home now. I'm drunk. My wife will be angry. But what about all the fun you're having here? Won't you miss that? Yeah, I will. But it's been two days I'm here. <laughs> you're so funny. You've only been here for hours. You're so drunk, mister. Are you sure? Yes, I am. Come on, come here with me. I've got something special for you. 
The man got up and followed the girl like her pet dog. What made me worried was him saying that he was here for two days? Was he telling the truth? But how could that be? I mean, he is obviously too drunk to realize what the hell he was saying. I ignored this and decided to have another beer. I live alone, so there was no rush to go home. My eyes kept on searching for Natalie when I heard chaos. The fat guy sitting at the table with the two Hooters girls has now got up from his seat. He could barely stand when I saw Natalie walking up to him. The fat guy drooled seeing Natalie coming closer to him and laughed in a pretty bizarre way. All the other men inside the restaurant were either passing out or drinking themselves to sleep, so no one bothered to pay any attention to this guy. I was the sober guy amongst them all, so I couldn't help but notice this freaking weird scenario. Natalie stopped in front of the man and ran her magical fingers on his cheek. Do you like me? Yes, a lot. <laughs> then will you do anything for me? A hypnotized look appeared in his eyes as he stared at Natalie and said, Of course. Something about this place, these girls, these men, weren't normal at all. Everything was so messed up here. I was thinking about leaving when the unexpected happened. Natalie took out an ice pick from the buckets of ice placed on the table and smiled creepily. She then raised the sharp ice pick to the man and said, Stab your hand with this. Wh what If you do this, you'll get a kiss. Don't you want a kiss from me? Yes, I do. Then do it. Now! The man took the ice pick from her and started stabbing his left hand vigorously. While he screamed in pain, all the Hooters girls began to laugh like enchanted witches. There was something in their accumulated laughter that made my bones chill. A cold rush of fear made my heart beat faster. What is this place? Who are these girls? Slowly, I realized that every man here was intoxicated. Something in that beer made him forget everything and believe that he was having a great time here. The fat guy was bleeding terribly and no one tried to help him. All the other men didn't even notice and the girls just laughed hysterically like they were watching a comedy show. Taking advantage of this, I ran to the exit door, but I found it locked. Where do you think you're going, handsome? I turned around and saw Natalie standing behind me. There was no beauty in her face. She looked ferocious, like a predator. Please, let me go. But why do you want to leave now? The party has just started. <laughs> We're going to have so much fun. I noticed a big rusty key attached to her waist, and I didn't waste a second more. I punched her hard in the face and made her tooth fall out. She screamed like a hyena and fell to the ground, holding her jaw. I snatched the key from her, took the one opportunity, and unlocked the door. I could hear the Hooters girl screaming and running towards me like a hungry wolf pack, but I ran for my life. I ran and ran until their screams faded away. I can't explain how I reached home that night, but I remember paying a hundred dollars to the truck driver who gave me a lift on that highway. He was probably stunned. He had no idea what a huge help he did for me. I wanted to go to the cops and take them to that sick Hooters outlet, but I'm scared that I might not come back alive if I go there again. Those girls were messed up more than any scary horror movie. Fear is real, that much I can guarantee. After a couple of low paid inferior jobs, I was on the verge of living in the streets. I was about to call my dad for some money when my roommate Kathy said, You know, Hooters is taking new girls. You can easily get the job. But let me tell you, at times, you might cross paths with some creeps. 
As a woman, I do that quite often. Are you sure? Yeah, the girl who works with me in the department store told me yesterday. I think you should give it a try. I heard they pay well. Taking her advice, I went to the Hooters outlet the next day. It was a pretty secluded area adjacent to the woods. The long highway stood like a pathway to another world. Even in the daylight, the area was pretty stranded. I went in and saw two men doing maintenance work and a man in his late fifties watching them with a strict eye. Seeing me walk in, he looked at me and scanned me from head to toe. Yes? Um, my name is Olivia. I heard you were in search of employees. Hooters girl. S sorry I'm looking for another Hooters girl. Where do you stay? Two blocks away. Hmm. You can go home with Riley then. What? There are rules here. One. Always wear the uniform during shifts. Two. Make the customers feel comfortable. And three. Never go home alone after work. You can start from tomorrow. Thank you so much. I needed this job. Pick up a set of new uniforms from the shelf in the corner, and don't be late. The owner was a blunt and cut to the chase guy, so I picked up my uniform without any more delay and left. I knew that the only reason he selected me was my physical features, which did make me uncomfortable, but beggars can't be choosers. The next day, I arrived at Hooters, all decked up. Three other girls were standing inside the restaurant, getting ready to receive customers. I walked to them and introduced myself. They were all nice to me. They gave me tips on how to handle creeps and pushovers tactfully. I asked them where Riley was, to which they replied she is on leave today. Once the door sign changed to open, various kinds of people started to come in. The restaurant got filled with people. We started serving drinks and food while keeping a charming smile on our faces. Though most customers behaved nicely, there were some creeps indeed. A guy was flirting relentlessly with all of us. Whenever someone went to his table, he would compliment our body and call this place heaven repeatedly. My coworker Samantha was a smart girl. Instead of going into any argument, she got that man hella drunk so that he kept quiet for a while. Being my first day, I was nervous, but putting on a confident face at the same time. Three hours went by without any trouble. Customers came and went like sea waves. I expected the night to get over like this when I heard jingling of boots behind me. I was standing with my back turned to the entrance, so I didn't see the customer who had just stepped in. I may have never looked back, if not for the girl at the following table who kept staring behind me with a startled face. I turned around and saw a man dressed like Freddy Krueger sitting near the bar. It was neither Halloween nor a themed night at the restaurant, so his costume immediately set all eyes on him. But he was pretty casual with the attention and didn't seem to get bothered by it. His costume was so point on that even the burnt scars covering his partial face seemed real. He was looking around the restaurant when our eyes met. As soon as he saw me, a filthy grin appeared on his face, and he waved at me with his metallic fingernails. Getting creeped out by his behavior, I turned my back to him and went to attend another table. I could feel that he was watching my every single move. Samantha came to me and said, Do you see that jackass? Must be a huge fan of horror movies. Doesn't he give you the creeps? Come on, don't think so much. You're doing great. Don't let anything mess that up. Also, in a few hours, you'll be going home. Yeah, but till then, he's going to sit there and watch me. Samantha assured me that there was nothing to worry about, but my anxiety kept rising every time I looked at him. Slowly, the night came to an end. It was close to midnight, and we were getting ready to close when I heard a spooky voice behind me. Can I get your number? With a shocked face, I turned back and saw that the man dressed as Freddy Krueger was now standing behind me, 
He smiled even bigger. I didn't want to give him any attention, so I came out strong. We are past closing hours, sir. Have a good night. That's not the answer to my question. Maybe you should stop asking stupid questions then. <laughs> you are so much more than I expected. You know all of our lives are just a dream. I think you're too drunk to realize you are not the real Freddy Krueger. It's time to go home, so scoot. I took a step to leave when he obscured my way and looked into my eyes. The death stare he gave me made my body numb. His smile faded and furious anger took over his face. He then leaned on my face and said in a chilling voice, This is not over yet. He walked out and I sat down on the chair, covered in sweat. Samantha gave me a glass of water and told me to report the owner about this guy immediately if he comes tomorrow. We all wrapped up and left for home. Samantha gave me a lift to the next block and then went on her way home. She lived in the opposite direction, so I had no other choice than to walk home by myself. It was a 10 to 12 minute walk, but it felt like a lifetime that night. The streets were empty. A stray dog barked at some distance and then disappeared behind the bush. The silence around me was so haunting that I was getting scared hearing my own footsteps. I was halfway through when I heard a cackle. Turning around, what I saw still gives me nightmares. The man in the Freddy Krueger costume was running at me at full speed, raising his sharp metal claws like a deranged psychopath. I screamed at the top of my lungs and started to run for my life. The fact that he followed me all this way was enough to incline that he wanted me by the hook or the crook. He was laughing like a maniac, enjoying my fear. I was wearing heels, which is why it wasn't easy to increase the pace, but I also didn't have the time to take my shoes off. I knew that if I stopped, he would catch me, and if he catches me, he will shred me into pieces. I dialed 911 while running, not knowing where I was going, but before I could make the call, a huge rock hit me hard on my wrist, and I fell to the ground, breaking my leg. I felt so dangerously that my broken bones sprung up underneath my skin. It was a horrible scene to see a bone of my body coming out like that, and the pain was excruciating. The man laughed and stopped in front of me as I suffered lying on the ground. <laughs> Why are you doing this? Told you, life is just a dream. But you didn't listen to me. Look, you wanted my number, right? Fine, you can have my number. See, that's why skinny witches like you get treated like this. You silly girls, don't listen the first time. You all think you own the world because you are beautiful, and everyone else is just filth and dirt. I didn't ask for these scars. But Freddy gave me another reason to live. When I saw him in the movie, I realized he's the one I'm supposed to be in life. You're just ill. Please, it doesn't have to be this way. Let me help you. I am not ill. I will make you just like me now. <laughs> Saying this, he raised his metal claws and was all but ready to strike on my face when I kicked him between the legs and he fell on the ground in pain. As soon as he did, I grabbed the rock and smashed his head with it. With one tough blow, the man passed out. I called 911 and waited there until the cops arrived. The cops came and took him into custody. He was unconscious the entire time. Then they took me to the nearby hospital for treatment. I lost a lot of blood and had to stay a month in the hospital. The man is now behind bars, and I hope he never walks free. My husband has been behaving quite odd for the past couple of days. I'm not sure, but I think he's cheating on me. No, I'm not just saying that. 
I do have valid reasons to suspect him. Like, he always came home after work. He wasn't a very party-going guy, but he's always late for the last couple months. And if I ask him why, he dodges my questions, never giving a satisfactory answer. Last night, I suddenly woke up and saw my husband wasn't there beside me. I looked at the clock. It was 3 a.m., so I got suspicious again. I tiptoed downstairs and overheard a conversation coming from the kitchen. No. Why would I lie to you? I was at a meeting. Believe me. Yes, yes. I will be there tomorrow. I'll take the day off. Okay. See you. As soon as I heard him disconnect the call, I returned to the bedroom quickly and pretended to be deeply asleep. He came back and laid down beside me, thinking I was asleep all this time. That day I decided I would find out and finish this once and for all. As my husband left for his office, I acted completely normal. Um, I have an important meeting today, uh, which I might run late, so don't wait for me. Okay. Drive safe. Yeah. Bye, Judy. I don't know why his last words felt like I would never see him again. I saw his car fade away from my window. Now, it's time for me to execute my plan. I waited half an hour and called his office. By this time, he should be there. After a few seconds, his secretary picked up the call. Berkshire Hathaway, how may I help you? Can I speak to David Smith? I'm sorry, ma'am, but today is his day off. May I take a message? No. I'll call tomorrow. Thanks. Tears came to my eyes. So he is lying to me. At least there's no confusing regarding that. My husband didn't know, but today when he was taking a shower, I connected my phone to his car's built-in GPS so that I could track him down. I didn't use it at first because my heart still hoped that if I called him at his office, he would be there. I hoped he wouldn't break my trust. I took a bus wearing a hoodie and joggers. I had my mask on so that no one could recognize me. I thought maybe he would be in a hotel or some restaurant with his secret mistress, but instead I found his car near an amusement park. I was shocked because that wasn't where I expected him to be. Maybe he was trying to play safe and it was his idea to avoid running into someone familiar. It was an afternoon on a weekday, so when I reached the amusement park, it wasn't that crowded as it used to be on the weekends. I found his red SUV parked near the gate behind three other cars, and my heartbeat got faster. I told myself that any minute now, once I enter this place and see him with another woman, our marriage is over. I put on the hoodie and started looking around for my husband. A bunch of kids were standing in a queue near the teapot ride. I carefully checked every guy, but I didn't see my husband anywhere. I was going to the other side of the park when I heard a kid yelling loud. Daddy, daddy, look! Mom bought me this big cotton candy. I turned around and saw a boy about four or five years old walking with a woman with blonde hair and sharp features. They both raised their arms and waved at someone standing behind me. I followed their eyes and saw the guy that the boy was addressing as daddy standing near a vending machine. It was my husband. My head started to throb in pain. I felt like my heart would explode. Not only is he sleeping with another woman, but he has a son? How long has he been pulling off this dual life? Oh my god. I grabbed the bench nearby and sat on it to catch my breath. I saw them laughing and spending time like a family. I did not doubt that my husband was fooling this other woman too. The veins in my forehead popped in furious anger. My eyes turned all red. I am not the kind of woman he stamps and walks away. I realized that if I divorce him, he would be even better. If I get out of his way, he will get back with his other family but I won't let that happen. I will make him pay for this. I will bring him pain. I started following him silently. They walked to the center of the amusement park to try on some rides. 
The kid pointed out to a bungee trampoline set up in the corner and started pleading with them to let him try it. At first, the woman said no, but my husband caressed her cheek and said something caring with a smile. He never smiled that way with me. Can you believe this man? I gave him my 12 years, and this is how he repays me? Suddenly, an evil idea came to my mind. I noticed the harness tied to the iron pole of the bungee trampoline. Beside the trampoline stood the roller coaster ride. Heavy bogies ran over the tracks while people screamed in an adrenaline rush. I knew what I had to do now. While everyone was busy buying tickets for the bungee trampoline, I slowly walked to it. A ride operator was standing there. I went to him and said that there was an issue on the teapot ride and I think that he should check it at once. Not having enough staff on a weekday, this guy went to the teapot ride thinking that there was some defects. No one was paying attention to me when I loosened the safety harness just a little bit. After that, I hid behind a bathroom stall to watch the show. The kid came rushing to the trampoline with his beloved mom and dad. Finding the non-assisted ride, they looked around when the ride operator came back with a confused face. It wasn't hard to guess that he didn't find any issue with the teapot ride as I lied to lure him away. He took their tickets and tied the kid with the safety harness. My husband was lighted and clapping in joy to see his son in that ride. He had no idea that soon his joys would fade away forever. The kid started to jump and the ride took off. He was jumping and yelling, I'm flying, Daddy! I'm flying! My eyes were stuck at the joint of the safety harness. The more he jumped, the more it started to loosen up. When he was at the top highest, a metallic crack occurred and the safety harness swooped away, making a whipping sound. The kid, tied to the other harness, got swung back with great force and his head hit the roller coaster track. The force was so strong that it only took a second and his skull smashed into pieces. He didn't even get to scream, but his mom did as blood splattered everywhere. I turned around and went straight to the mall washroom. I took off my hoodie and joggers and put them in my handbags, changing into my other clothes. I am very much aware that the CCTV footage will catch me loosening up the trampoline harness, so I have already brought a new pair of clothes with me. Then I started to walk towards the exit. People in the amusement park were screaming and running past me towards that bungee trampoline, and I couldn't care less. I walked to a secluded area a few meters away from the park, then burnt my hoodie and joggers and returned home the same way. My husband didn't come home that night. I left him calls and messages like I was really worried about not hearing back from him. He came back all messed up the following day. His eyes were swollen because of crying too much. I opened the door and said, What happened? Where were you? I was so worried, David. What the hell is going on? Nothing. I just had a terrible day. Can you please leave me alone? Why? Because your son died? I couldn't pretend anymore. His eyes widened in fear as well as shock. You knew? Then why didn't you say anything? I'm leaving you, David. I grabbed my luggage and got into my car. David sat with a blown away face. He didn't say anything, and I didn't wait to listen. I enjoyed seeing him suffer. Now, he will never know who killed his son, even if the cops find the CCTV footage. For the rest of his life, he will keep wondering, and if he suspects me of this crime, there will be no evidence to prove it. No one saw my face. There's no proof of me going there, as I never took my car or a cab. So I was never there. I don't care if I go to hell, because I had my revenge. Now he will realize what it feels like to lose someone you love the most.
In my nearly three decades of experience in building maintenance, repair, and renovation, I've never worked at a place as unusual as the local Motel 6. Now, the other peculiar thing about the Motel 6 you wouldn't know unless you worked there, management was terrified of the lights ever going out. We had two backup generators on site. Our generator was diesel, the other some fancy solar thing. Given how remote the motel was in location, I could understand having a good backup, but two generators was excessive. The manager, a fussy middle-aged guy named Owen, insisted that maintenance check and swap out all the light bulbs on the property each month. I never made the connection between Owen's obsession with the lights and generators with Motel 6's official slogan until the night of our first true blackout. If you're unfamiliar with Motel 6's advertising, they have a very famous tagline they use in all their commercials. We'll leave the lights on for you. It all started with a week of nasty storms we got last year. This was back in January, so we didn't have a ton of guests. I think at the time of the incident, maybe 20 rooms were occupied, or maybe 30. We'd gotten eight days straight of rain first, then slush, then snow. Owen was worried that the wind might knock the lines down and we'd be stuck. All of the cloud cover meant the solar generator would be useless, so the boss sent Mikey to make sure the diesel cans were full in case we needed the other power source. Sure enough, on the ninth night of the crappy weather, the lights began to flicker. We need the generator up and running, Logan, now, Owen demanded, running into my office. I sighed and picked up my radio from the desk. Hey, Mikey, I got Owen here with me. Looks like the snow might knock out our... As if on cue, the lights flickered again and came back much dimmer. Shoot, yeah, I think we're about to lose electricity. Can you go ahead and fire up the diesel so we can keep the lights on? We, uh, might have a problem there, boss, Mikey said. All of the blood drained from Owen's face at Mikey's reply. Can you meet me in the uh, generator room? We left the office and hurried through the parking lot. It was snowing hard, and Owen nearly slipped on some hidden ice, grabbing for my arm to keep from falling. We crossed over to the small maintenance building and hurried inside. Mikey was already sitting on the diesel generator when we walked to the small back room. He had a sheepish grin that was more of a wince than anything. Uh, now, I'll uh, tell you the issue with the generator, Mikey promised, holding up his hands. But first, you have to promise not to be mad. Before I could reply, the lights flickered a third time and went black. Owen screamed from somewhere behind me. I reached into my jacket and pulled out my flashlight. Mikey did the same. We need to get the lights back on, Owen shouted. I made my way over to one of the shelves in the room and rummaged around for a moment, then pulled out a few emergency lanterns I knew we had in storage. Once those were active, the back room was bright and almost cozy. Even with the return of the light, Owen didn't look relieved. We have to hurry, he told me, clutching a lantern to his chest. We only have a few minutes before it's too late for the guests. Owen turned to Mikey. What is wrong with the generator? So, uh, here's the thing, Mikey replied, looking down at his feet. The generator is fine, but we're out of diesel. I've been borrowing the fuel from my truck and replacing it with water. You idiot! You absolute moron! Owen spat at Mikey. There's no fuel? The guests have been in the dark now for... He checked his watch. More than three minutes. Complete. Total dark. Do you get it? They could start turning any- Owen was interrupted by the most savage scream I have ever heard coming from inside the Motel 6. The three of us looked at each other. Then Owen sprinted for the door to the maintenance room. Owen locked and bolted the door, then began trying to push a table against it as a barricade. Help me before they realize we're here, Owen hissed. Mikey and I moved to help him push furniture in front of the door. 
There was another shriek from the motel, then another, then what almost sounded like howling. Both start with each other, Owen whispered. Once some of them get into the parking lot, they'll try the door. We need to stay quiet. What is going on? I asked. The decision was made for us when I took out my phone. We didn't have great reception at the motel, even in clear weather, but the constant snowstorms had completely killed the signal. We should make a run for our cars, Mikey suggested. It was cold in the maintenance building and getting colder every minute. I wasn't eager to go outside, but I knew Mikey was right. Owen protested as we cleared the barricade. The three of us sat in a circle as Owen spilled his guts. All Motel 6s have a terrible design flaw, or maybe a curse or an intentional defect created to experiment on people. Everything was safe as long as the lights were on in or around the building, but if the motel ever experienced true darkness for just a few minutes, it would begin to alter the minds of all inside. The effects, I'm told, are rapid and extreme, Owen explained, occasionally glancing over his shoulder at the door. Think of it like a form of rabies. That honestly sounds like a campfire story used to scare folks, I said. I don't believe it. The three of us began to argue in whispers, still sitting in our little ring around some lanterns. Mikey and I wanted to call the police immediately. Owen begged us not to. He figured the damage was already done, and if we got the cops involved, it could cause terrible press for the Motel 6. He followed along with us when we crept out the door into the parking lot. I did see him tuck a hammer into his belt before we left. We waded through the snow in a single file line. We were nearly to my truck when we heard the scream. All three of us turned and froze at the same time. There was a young woman standing under a streetlight staring at us. She was only wearing a nightgown despite the wind and snow. Her face looked dazed, eyes blank, head tilted strangely. When she noticed us watching, the woman growled and began to sprint towards us. She'll kill us all, Owen yelped, pushing Mikey down and making a run for it. That was a mistake. The woman jerked her head towards Owen and began to chase him through the snow. I have to admit that the manager's story felt very real at that moment. There was something deeply wrong with the guest, the way she ran barefoot in the snow. Behind us, Mikey said, pointing towards the motel. It was hard to see with the snow, but I could just make out a few shadows on the other side of the parking lot moving towards us. Run, I hissed. We lost sight of Owen as we made a beeline for my truck. Maybe the other guests didn't notice us or simply didn't care. Once we were in my truck in one piece, I locked the doors and took a breath. We gotta go back for Owen, I said. Do we though? Mikey asked. I pulled out my phone and was surprised to see I had a weak signal. Call 911, I said tossing Mikey the phone. I'm going back for the boss. I didn't have to go far after leaving my truck to find Owen. He was standing in front of the entrance to the Motel 6 holding his hammer and panting. There was a crumbled body at his feet, wearing a blood-stained nightgown. It was the guest from earlier. She was going to kill me, Owen whispered, clutching his bloody hammer. I had no choice. The woman was small and looked fragile in the snow. She didn't seem too dangerous. I didn't have a choice, Owen repeated sounding less confident. I was in danger, right? I walked Owen back to my truck. The police and the fire department both arrived within the next 10 minutes. After one look at the blood splattered Owen, they led him off while taking statements from Mikey and me. I was sitting in an interrogation room at the police station when they told me what happened. There was no Motel 6 curse, no danger in the dark, it was the storm. It knocked out more than the electricity. 
It also caused a gas leak. That was all it was. Gas. It caused the guests to become delusional and confused. They weren't dangerous, only lost and needing help. I still have nightmares about Owen standing above the body of the girl in the snow. To this day, the gas that caused this was still being investigated. This happened when I was 13 years old. I'm from Nashville, but I stayed at my grandfather's place when this particular incident occurred. They lived in a small town named Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. Those who have never been to this place must know it's an ideal spot for nature lovers. The city is built around the Shenandoah River. Technology hadn't completely devoured childhood back then, so kids liked playing outside. So it was my third visit, and I wanted to go to the newly opened amusement park with my friend Ronald. I was his next door neighbor, so that's how our friendship took place. He was a very chill guy, but loved making fun of random people. After breakfast one Sunday morning, we decided to go to the park. The amusement park had a water slide and a McDonald's, so we planned to eat there. We rode our bikes and reached near the park. Being the town's recent attraction, the place was booming with kids. There was cotton candy and popcorn stalls, various games and rides. Ronald pointed out the water slide and we immediately ran towards it. We brought our swimming trunks, so we went to the washroom to change into them. The public washroom had toilets in a row. Ronald went to the first one, and the one beside him was occupied, so I went to the third one in the row. Whoever was between the two of us didn't make any sound. Ronald and I were constantly talking and discussing our plans for the day. Ronald and I came out and we were washing our hands when he looked at the closed washroom door in the middle. Whoever's in there has diarrhea. Stop it, he can hear us. I don't give a damn. Saying this, he walked straight and kicked hard on the toilet door. Nothing happened for 10 seconds. Then, the door creaked open. A man stood there, keeping his head down. We couldn't see his face as he wore a baseball hat. He didn't say anything, just laughed in a pretty weird way. <laughs> Ronald and I didn't wait anymore, and we walked out. While walking out, Ronald said in a low voice, what a creep. We bought two tickets and we went to stand in the queue. To take the water slide, we had to walk up to a three foot high platform and then slide down into the big O9. nine. In the pool, Ronald and I were pulling off some challenges of our own. We were trying to stay underwater while holding our breath when I saw a person submerged inside the pool at some distance from us. Even though it was just for a second, I didn't fail to recognize that person. It was that same man from the washroom. Freaking out a bit, I opened my mouth and drank some chlorine water. Ronald rose to hear me coughing. I somehow controlled my troubled breath. What happened? I think I just saw that man underwater. He was staring at us. Which man? That creep in the washroom. What? Where? Ronald started looking around the pool, hoping to spot that guy, but surprisingly, we couldn't find him. We went down the water slide some more times, but that man was nowhere. When we had enough of the water slide, we thought of going for some ice cream. The ice cream bar was at the back of the park, so we had to walk for a while. While I was telling him how much fun this place is, Ronald stopped all of a sudden. You're right. He is stalking us. I followed his eyes and saw that man again. This time, he was sitting on a bench right beside the ice cream bar. He was still keeping his head down, and finally, I started to feel something bad was coming our way. Without saying anything, we walked to the bar, grabbed our ice creams, and we were coming back when the man lifted his head. I have never seen such scary eyes before. His eyes were too big and bright. Not in a good way. There was absolutely no expression on his face. He wasn't moving a muscle, 
and just sitting on the bench completely wet and staring at us in a death-cold way. I was sure he was in that pool with us and watching us. This guy is so weird. I told you I saw him in the pool. Why did he go in wearing all his clothes? Maybe he's too lazy to do laundry. I couldn't help but laugh, and Ronald joined me too. We ignored him and walked past him eating our ice creams. For the next 20 minutes, every ride we took, every corner of the park we went to, that man was there. He was following us the entire time. We tried to lose him, but I don't know how he always found us. Ronald and I got pretty freaked out by this weird guy and decided to call it a day and return home. We went to the washroom one more time to change into our regular clothes. We watched the man standing as we left and constantly staring at us as we stood outside the washroom. What is his problem, man? Let it be. We're leaving anyway. And... But Ronald couldn't stop himself anymore. He shouted at the man. Leave us alone, you freak! I told him just to ignore the guy, but he went on shouting and cursing at the man. A few people started to look at him with suspicious eyes as Ronald went on screaming furiously. The man stood there a few seconds more and then vanished into the crowd. We didn't notice that people went ahead in the line and we got left out. The line for the washroom was now too big, so we got frustrated. We just wanted to leave quickly as we had enough. There was a small tent at the corner that had tools for storage for the amusement park. Let's go change there. Ronald pointed at it and I followed him. We decided to watch our backs so I changed while Ronald stood in front of the tent. The back of the tent was dark. There was a big tree and dense bushes behind it. I was wearing my t-shirt when I felt the bushes move a bit. I stopped and watched them for a second when Ronald yelled at me. Come on! Hurry up! Um, yeah, almost done. I came out with my backpack and he asked why I was taking so long. I told him I saw something in those bushes, and he laughed, saying it was probably a squirrel. Next, it was my turn to stand in front of the tent. While standing near the tent, my eyes were roaming around like crazy, thinking the man would appear again, but I didn't see him. After waiting for almost ten minutes, when Ronald didn't come out, I got a bit worried. Ronald, are you done? Who's taking long now? But still, no reply came. I got extremely worried this time and quickly went to the back to check. As I peeked at the back of the tent, I saw a horrible scene. Ronald's dead body was lying near the bush. His head was wrapped with his t-shirt. It seemed like someone strangled him to death. Whoever did this had a lot of strength because Ronald didn't even get the chance to struggle. My veins froze and after standing there like a statue, I finally let out a dying scream. The security of the park came rushing with so many other people. They called the cops, and everyone got terrified after hearing about the murder. As the cops lifted his t-shirt, another shock caught me off guard. Ronald wasn't just strangulated. His head was turned backwards like a broken doll. The one who did this covered his head with the t-shirt, because he wanted it to be a big reveal. Me and some other people in the park also spoke about the weird man following us. I even gave details to the sketch maker, and the death of my friend is now an ongoing murder investigation in West Virginia. I don't know where that man is now, but I hope the cops catch him soon before he takes another innocent life in the sickest way possible. <laughs>